Please rise and I will the arrival of Professor Doctor Adela Kamuzaman, the Berlin Faculty of Medicine, who is here today. Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning. Professor Dr. Adiba Kamran Zaman, the Dean Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, His Excellency Tan Sri Tan Sri Datuk Datuk, distinguished guest of Professor Dr. Philip Poi Tunhua. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Welcome to the inaugural lecture by Professor Dr. Philip Poi Junhua entitled Geriatric Care and Challenges to the Healthcare System in Malaysia. Without further delay, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Adiba Kamun Zaman to chair the lecture and introduce Prof. Philip Poi Junhua. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yang diraihkan Profesor Dr. Philip Poi Junhua, yang dihormati Tuan Dr. Aisha Ong, Pro Vice Chancellor of University Malaya, 
faculty members, students, um, special guests of Professor Philip, um, friends and colleagues. We're here once again. This is the second uh, inaugural lecture for the faculty in as many days, and I'm, I'm very proud to introduce Prof. Philip, who many of you know is one of the um, icons of the Department of Medicine. Um, I was once described as like a mother of infectious disease, and I think, Philip, it's fair to say in Malaysia, and I think, Philip, it's fair to say that you'd be one of the fathers of geriatric medicine in Malaysia. <clears throat> Prof. Philip trained at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and graduated in 1981. He was conferred with the LRCP in S. Ireland and the MB MBBS, the, the Irish equivalent of the MBBS from the National University of Ireland. He subsequently obtained the membership of the Royal College of Physicians, also in Ireland, and um, then trained in geriatric medicine at Oxford, St. Bart's, London, and Southampton before returning to Malaysia. His uh, major contribution is, of course, to the development of a new geriatric unit at uh, UMMC, the first purpose-built ward for acutely ill elderly patients in Malaysia. Dr. Boy is in the Ministry of Health Technical Committee for the National Health Care for the Elderly Program, which is involved in policy-making decisions concerning elderly care and in training their trainers to improve the quality of health care delivery to all elderly Malaysians. As you all are very aware, um, Malaysians and, and indeed um, the rest of the world are living uh, much longer and we all, um, I think, are a little unprepared to face uh, this um, uh, uh, the number of uh, elderly people that are in need of, of care, not just in, in the country, but, but globally. So geriatric medicine has become one of the most important specialties in internal medicine, and rightly so. Supervising undergraduate and postgraduate students at the university, uh, Prof. Philip has also been actively, actively involved in lectures, research and consultancy and has contributed to many chapters in textbooks and uh, clinical practice guidelines. He has also inspired many new um, specialists uh, who come through the master's program to join geriatric medicine. Um, it's always a tussle between infectious disease and geriatric medicine, um, but somehow I think geriatric medicine seems to be winning. Um, he has... <laughs> I think there's more money in geriatric medicine. <laughs> That's why. Um, no, not true. He has been invited uh, as a speaker in many Asia Pacific conferences and uh, was a former vice president of the uh, Geronto Gerontological Association of Malaysians, currently the president of the Malaysian Society of Geriatric Medicine. He not only contributes nationally, but has also been very active in the region and um, was a founding member of the Asia Pacific Geriatric Network, where he helped create an informal but important network amongst the leading geriatricians in the region. And one of the fruits of this network was uh, the establishment of the Asia Pacific Geriatric Conference, which is now at, organized annually in different countries. And this has helped to train and um, uh, further geriatricians to gain exposure in different care delivery systems in the various region. So we all look forward to um, your um, elucidation of the challenges in the healthcare system in Malaysia as we confront the um, aging population in the country and the region. Prof. Philip. Very good morning to all of you, and thank you very much for making time to come to this lecture. And uh, I'd like to thank especially all my guests sitting on the second and third rows, and my mother here as well, uh, for making the effort to come all the way uh, to come for this lecture. My topic is geriatric care and challenges in healthcare system in Malaysia. And next to this slide, you'll see a very vibrant, colorful picture, which was actually the last the last, uh, hang on a second, let's see, put the slide on. Yeah, 
the last uh, self-portrait of a painter from Norway called Edward Munch. You might remember Munch uh, more famously as the person who drew the scream, you know, the one that you see in psychiatric textbooks. But he did a, he did a self-portrait here, which is epitomizes aging in a way, uh, showing that, you know, as you get older, you're, you have this message of self, you know, having independence as well as a feeling of loneliness. This man's standing there forlornly between his clock and his bed. The clock, if you notice, has no numbers, no face, no hands. Timeless. And behind it, you see his, his work, all his work, all the paintings that he's done before. And next to him is the colourful bed, which reflects illness, disability, and impending death. So there's a lot of messages coming through from this painting, and I thought, uh, and was better, well, well put by my colleague Desmond O'Neill, who uh, explained this to me more vividly than I could actually explain to you. So we will proceed from here. The 21st century faces pressing issues, none more than three of these big ones, climate change, terrorism, and global aging. And you guess what I'm going to talk about, because I'm not going to talk about climate change here. Yeah, you can see here that uh, aging goes right across the world. There's no, there's no one country where you don't have old people, except maybe the Antarctica. This slide is actually a very interesting slide from Hans Rosling who has given fantastic talks on TED. If you have the chance, please look at TED Talks and Google Hans Rosling, because Hans Rosling has developed this Gapminder map, and it shows how countries from different parts of the world color differently. If you can see the, the uh, yellow bits here would be the Americas, and the size of the bubble would be the size of the population, and you can see the red bits are the Asian countries, and you can see that China has a huge bubble here, and Malaysia is this little bubble down here. Can you see that? So we are actually ahead in terms of money, earnings, than China in 2010. I'm not sure now. Uh, and we're certainly having a better life expectancy than most of the Chinese. But of course, there are other countries in Asia that have have uh, gone beyond us, which is like Japan, Hong Kong, and such like, and South Korea as well. So this map tells you that we are not that far off being healthy and we live long. So living healthier, longer, richer, better lives, Malaysians can or not? I hope so. Because when you see the newspapers, it's always a problem. It always shows that aging and age care is a problem. Aging ungracefully, this is a photograph of a, a Sun newspaper that uh, came out first front page, I think. Aging ungracefully. But ageism is baseless. We need human rights convention for human, uh, older people because as we live longer, it's essential that we can all live with dignity, respect and security. And in most countries, it's still considered acceptable to deny people of work, health care and education or the right to participate in government because of their age. That includes us in this country. So please understand my retirement is coming up this year. <laughs> the 2002 Madrid International Plan of Action for Aging states that a society for all ages encompasses the goal of providing older persons with the opportunity to continue contributing to society. And here we have actually examples in front of us. The first few rows here actually have people who have retired who are still contributing to society. And I, I'm grateful to know these people. And to work towards this goal, it's necessary to remove whatever excludes or discriminates against them. So what are the things that discriminate against us older people? As the young ones up there will not understand yet. Social attitudes towards aging, feminization of aging, Housing, you know, houses are really difficult, really difficult, okay? There's so much stairs to surmount everywhere, steps everywhere, and uh, we have to think of solutions now. Care providers, 
you know, we know, maids are not coming anymore. So it's going to be tougher for Malaysians. So be aware of that. Economically, the pensions, is it sufficient for retirement? People are retiring early or later? Some people can't retire. And medical issues like physical and mental health come. The problem is age, our age, the number that we have behind our age, you know, the, the years that we live, places a structure on our lifespan. Society's workforce spends the first 10 to 20 years preparing, preparing you. And then you participate from the time you're adolescence until 65 or 60 in Malaysia. And then you withdraw from society and retire at the age of 65 or thereabouts. So people think of aging problems as a productivity issue. People become less productive as you get older. Is this true? I'm not sure. So it's up to you as younger people to prove that this is a myth that you need to overcome. Because these sort of cartoons, which makes us laugh, have to make us also think, you know, no pension, only tension, keep working, Johnny, he says. He's telling himself he's got to keep going. And you can see that this is the epitome of uh, the security guards you see outside Po Kong and elsewhere. <laughs> Toothless and probably no bullets inside either. Okay. So 80% of Malaysians worry about not having enough for retirement. I think I can put myself in that list as well. So what do we do? We make them work, work and work. So maybe in the future, you have this sort of situation. The widow says, oh, I mean, the, the, the relative says, poor Uncle Fred, such a tragedy. What do you mean? He was 90. He had a full life. Then someone mentions he was finally set to retire next year. So this could be the future. But I'm just wondering whether you want to have this sort of future. Mind you, my uncle is still working. <laughs> okay. And the economic value of longevity is actually important to us because ill health, we know at the end of our lives, is a constant, constant thing. We can't avoid this. Very few of us are playing football at age of 95 and then get struck by lightning. Very few, very few. We will get some ill health before we get there. And the health status, not aging, is the thing that causes our rise in expenditure. And if you have 5% health improvement in the elderly, you have 1% less health expenditure for those over 65. And you see, one of the ways to avoid this is these, these old people who are sitting around having a cup of tea in Vietnam. I was walking by and I said, ah, good shot for a slide to talk about. And so that's how you get these sort of slides. Aging is different for everyone. There are survivors, delayers, and escapers. And you can see here relatives of mine here. Uh, actually, one of them is my mother, and you can see that she looks the same as that photograph, although that photograph was taken a few years ago. Um, this is a description of people over the age of 80. There are three types of 80-year-old plus plus, okay? The lady in the middle, my aunt, who has since passed on, an ex-matron and a previous inmate in my ward, uh, was a survivor. That means 40% of 80-year-olds actually suffer from an illness but survive to live beyond 80. The delayers are the ones that reach 80 without trouble and then suffer from illness, which is my mom sitting down with Tongkat there. And the escapers are the ones that survive over 80 and not have any problems whatsoever. And that's my aunt standing up. So you can see there are different types of people. You want to, what, which one do you want to be when you get old? When you get beyond 80, do you want to be a survivor, a delayer? or an escaper. Gentlemen, plan, plan for your retirement now, before you start a medical career. So maintaining health as we grow older is very important. And again, I've used my aunt because she went to the newspapers. She went to the newspapers and this was star two a few years back. And she's showing off her, her, her abilities. And uh, I think this is an important thing to keep going because 
In the 1980s, we used to see on the wards, when I first came back, uh, late 80s, 90s, people were on the wards were about 60, 70 years old. So, you know, they were really old already at that point. In the 1990s, people were in the wards were around 70, 70 plus, and they were doing quite well. But now we are seeing patients who are all 90s, 80 pluses coming in to our ward. So we can see the change. And Charul and Mopin, you've seen the change, haven't you? This, this is a, a demographic change as well. We are lasting longer, lasting longer. So here we are. So what I'm trying to explain to you in this whole geriatric thing is about healthy life expectancy. It's no point in living a long life, but all the time in bed. You really have to be healthy. And just, we don't have any figures from Malaysia because we didn't release it to the WHO, so we can't get it. Ministry of Health rules, you know. So we have to have uh, something similar, and I think we are somewhere between around the Turkish region. Our life, life expectancy is around 76, 77 for women, and about 73, 74 for men. And you hope to have a life expectancy, healthy life expectancy, of about 16 years after you retire at 60. 16 years. After that, you're on your own. Because most people get some disability, some illness, and get problems, okay? So what we want to do is expand that healthy bit and reduce the sickness bit so that it is less cost to the government and the society at large and less cost to yourself so you can enjoy yourselves a bit more, yeah? Mobility and excess is one of the issues that we need to worry about because this is something we don't have in Malaysia. All these slides were taken elsewhere in a different country, somewhere called, some place called Taipei. You look at this, they have signs for everything, wheelchairs, mothers, old ladies, everything. But in Malaysia, we don't have this. They have access to markets for wheelchairs, not like our markets, which are all wet everywhere. They have bicycle lanes, and they even put up signs in English. Health is not valued until sickness comes. And I think that's a true truism, right? We all assume we're going to be healthy for the rest of our lives, but you don't, you won't be, okay? So quality of life is important. So how do we develop this quality of life? Is having active participation, involvement, and integration of the older person, person okay? In the hospital, involving in decision-making. Don't just start telling them what to do. The older person now is educated. They've got degrees. They understand you now. Not like yeah, those 20 years ago when everybody was uh, rubber tappers and tin miners or kabun, you know, the, the, the kabuns, you know. They are much more intelligent. And we should bring up the ideas of advanced directives as well. There's been a big change in developing countries like us. We've had the old set of morbidity issues, all the infections, infectious diseases and stuff, but we're also accumulating an arising new set of problems with cardiovascular disease, malignancy, diabetes, and aging and diseases of the elderly. And the problem is our health care is not ready to cope with the emerging diseases that we still have and the emerging, the retained infectious diseases that we still have. So those are the problems that we face now in the healthcare society in, in, in Malaysia. Non-communicable disease, NCDs, carries the burden in older people because we, we survive. We are the delayers survivors. And 70% of people have at least one chronic illness like arthritis, hypertension, hearing impairments, heart disease, and major depression. And I can admit to you that I already have two of those. You can decide which ones. So we have expressions in geriatrics about what the giants are, the, giant, the gigantic issues that impact on older people. This is a lady from Jogja who still can squat and sit in a little chair and can stand up and sell things to you. But what I'm pointing out here, the, the things that I repeat over and over again to medical students, the five eyes that you need to know that all of us will go through stages of instability, immobility, and then when we become immobile, we become incontinent and become depressed, intellectually impaired, and then we get poisoned by our doctors. So be aware, doctors can be our worst enemies when you get older. So we need to plan ahead. Not like this slide, where the D cannot be fit in. 
So what do we do with the healthcare system? We have a fantastic network of house, uh, hospitals everywhere already, from Pusat Kesihatan Kecil's right up to the big, big tertiary hospitals like ours. Problem is the next cohort, me and Prof Wong Kam Tong and everybody there sitting on the fourth row, <coughs> we are better educated. I, and most of us will be degree holders when we go into hospital. So Prof Sharul and Prof Tan, you have your work cut out. We will have higher expectations and we'll need quality and medical support. None of this nonsense that we are giving now. <laughs> because we, health workers, nurses included, we need to be prepared for this silver tsunami through education, research, and service provisions. We all have to be ready. And we have to move, there's no time. We have to strive to enable, not disable. And this painting epitomizes it. Many of you might notice that this is old man is still doing his work. He's a famous artist called Matisse. And Matisse, in his old age, because he was crippled with arthritis, could not paint properly anymore. And he started cutting out pieces of paper and plastering it in and selling it for millions of dollars. Not bad, huh? Okay. So we hope that we can find new jobs like this and enable ourselves, not disable ourselves. This is called the snail, by the way, to educate you. I asked the Singaporeans, they knew this. So I like to educate all Malaysians as well to know that this is this title of snail. So who will care in the community? The spouse, my wife, the family, or institutions? Now, this is a very old slide, but I keep showing it because we need to move. Now it's cost more, actually. <laughs> it's not two ringgit anymore. It's probably five ringgit now. We studied this early on when I first came back to Malaysia. The relationship with the carer. Why don't they want to care? And we found that the nurses, nurses did not want to know. Or no, not really, they didn't want to know. They wanted to know, but the nurses, the nurse tutors didn't teach them enough. Only eight hours in three years of elderly care. So we've improved on that now. We've increased it to a little bit longer. How many more hours? Nursing tutors? 18, 30 hours. But I hope it's different topics rather than the same topics stretched out. <laughs> but it's important then that you know, we have better nurses ready to cope with this. There are overcrowding issues in many hospitals. This is a very old photograph. I think uh, Dr. Amin uh, has now cleared the beds and made things much better. Is that right? Yes. But discharge support programs in Malaysia are still in an infancy. We are still stuck somewhere in the middle of a snake, trying to find our way out of hospital. Every time you get admitted, you can't get your way out because there's something to put you back. Nosocomial infections, bus, I mean, uh, problems with the getting a nursing home, and even relatives who don't want to know you anymore. Okay. So, um, there are several ways of doing things to try and improve the care transition. You can either get them to have uh, home visits or follow up telephone calls. And we tried doing this. We used a telephone call model and the nurses, uh, Rafia and all these people will know this model that tried, we tried to do, where we would phone and when they discharge them, we would phone them regularly every day to make sure the caregivers gave the right things, did the right things, watched the pressure sore and such like and hope that along the time that they uh, received this telephone support, they would start to find that the community will accept them back and start to drop in and help them as well. This is theoretical. So at the point when you see deem safe at this point here, when the blue phone call stop, that the caregiver would have a bit more work, but you'll have a lot more from the green section to support you from the community. That's the theoretical side. We found that the telephone calls, when we thought, when they're stable, we stopped them. And we spent about 49 days on average to, to phone, phone all these people. And we delayed readmission by about 60 days. But the problem is, the moment you stop phoning them, they came back in hospital within a month or just beyond a month. So it's a problem. This is what the real problem, reality is when you stop phoning, 
community support disappears as well, and the caregiver cannot cope. Caregiver cannot cope. So is this nosocomial dependency? Nosocomial being something you gain from hospital. You come into hospital and everybody thinks, ah, it's not off my neck now, I don't have to worry anymore. So do we go there, to the old folks' home? Or home alone? This is a photograph I took in a newspaper in Hong Kong just after I gave a talk. And I said, ah, oh, this is a nice photograph because it's so, so classic of Chinese families. They sit there with the TV set, see? The TV set and the fan, all wrapped up in plastic so it's never used. <laughs> because you don't want the dust, you know? Uh, it's so classic. Yeah? I thought it was so good. And the problem is, if we don't reach out from the hospitals, there's very little they can do, because how can I get help if I can't leave the room? And this is a classic uh, question that a lot of uh, elderly people have. They can't get out of the room. We, don't, we have actually some of these theories that we have here up here. This was a slide taken from my colleague and from Japan, and it shows that there are sort of all these things that are put out there, preventative care service, home care service, and we are all adopting these issues. But the question is, is it enough or not? Is it enough? So i like to leave you with a summary of geriatric care and some food for thought for all the young people up there because this is what you need to know. The geriatric syndromes, the five eyes, impact on the function of older people. So you need to keep the elderly healthy and reduce disability life years. Avoid nosocomial dependency and disability. You have to have them shorter in hospitals so that they need to have more earlier skill discharge planning, which requires you to have efficient communication with patient, family, and providers in, in, the, in the whole package. Okay? Don't just say, oh, today you're home, tomorrow you're going home. Sort of, it's last minute, nobody's ready, the elderly are not ready, the families are not ready. It's impossible to hang, hang, handle the hospital admissions that we have now like before. It's very important that we enhance our caregiving capacities in the community. So how do we do this? I borrowed this slide from Adiba, Prof. Adiba's uh, tree of knowledge many years ago. <laughs> yes, it's yours. <laughs> but I've changed the words. Education and research in healthcare needs to be done to overcome ageist attitudes to impact upon the citizen, senior citizens, the students, and the community so that we can get future generation of well-trained doctors and healthcare workers to compress morbidity so that you can actually play football at 95 and get struck by lightning and die there. That will be the best way. And have everything else involved here. Older person's well-being, economic productivity to continue, and national and international reputation of your healthcare system so that it'll be an example to the rest of the world. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs> this uh, is a significant picture because this is what happens in Korea when you celebrate your 60th birthday. I will be 60 in a few months' time, so I will probably not wear this. So I'm going to show you this so that you know what happens in Korea. This is the coming of age for Koreans. At 60, it's time for you to let go and have sweets. All these are sweets in front of him. You'll notice this was all kindly generated, uh, donated by Samsung. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge a few people. And I'd like to start with my late father, Peter Poi, who is in his most comfortable position, leaning against his favorite French car, wearing his nice sarong and by the beach. The perfect, relaxed pose. I shall miss him and I have always missed him. My mother, who incidentally is wearing something similar to the photograph I took. I thank you for that. And my family, who are in the shadows of the trees, but never mind, you will see a better picture later on. And my dear wife. But that's very important. That was just how I started. What is important is how we've actually developed units here. And I'd like to thank the late John Bosco for dragging me home from UK. 
Anwar Zaini for pushing me forward and saying, you can start this. KL Go for supporting me very firmly. I don't know where he is. Is he here? But followed by Wan Asman, KJ Go, and Prof Sanjeev, who have continued to support the geriatric unit. And I thank all the heads of the department for this, because this was, uh, without their help and support, I think it would be very, very difficult. Of course, uh, <laughs> and I think that's because they reflected the vision that he could see as well, that they would get old one day. <laughs> These are the people who made the difference. My first trainees, who you can see here, Dr. Lee sends his apologies, who is now head of the geriatric services in the Ministry of Health. Dr. Ko Waikert, who has actually kindly come all the way from Ipoh. Thank you very much, Waikert. My former student, and also now my colleague. Professor Srinivas, uh, Dr. Srinivas now in uh, Glen Eagles, and Tunku Aizan, who is the director of the Institute of Aging. Thank you, Tunku, for coming. And two ladies here, Chia Yok Chin, who is also not able to come, who used to be the head of primary care, who helped us push out some papers at the beginning. And Prof. Zaleha Omar, who has been a real close friend to help us along. And this is my headmaster, who pushed me to Ireland in the first place, because he's Irish. And he said, why do you want to go to England for? You're going to Ireland. So I said, okay, brother, you tell me where to go. And here he is, holding a bottle that I gave him of St. Paul's. The label is called St. Paul's, because we come from, I come from the school of St. Paul's Institution. I think, Kaysin, you are from there too. So we have some venerated people here as well from that school. And so was John Bosco. We helped Zaleha, I helped Zaleha uh, set up the Masters of Rehab Medicine, although I'm now out of the history books there. And you can see here familiar faces, a very young Zaleha and myself examining the head of the department now, Nazira, who are all busy. <laughs> We are all busy opening the World Congress today at KLCC. Can't recognize them, can you? They've all grown older. So have I. The pioneers of Malaysian geriatrics in 2004 were only six geriatricians. You can see five of them here. Dr. Lee, Dr. Yao, who also has come. Uh, Rajban Singh, who you know famously over the radio. And Sriniwas and myself, and the one standing behind taking the photo, Dr. Kowaikia. We have moved on. From 1994, we had three geriatricians. 2004, 10 years later, we had six. It was a very slow process at the beginning. 2009, we had 10. And 2016, we've got 26 and moving upwards. I think I'm losing count now. In fact, uh, thanks to uh, the efforts of our junior lecturers and all that, uh, they've, they've actually push so many people in, I'm, I'm losing count as to who's a trainee and who's not. It's quite frightening. But they are scattered all along some Semenanjung as well as also East, Co uh, East Malaysia. These are some of the team that I'd like to pay tribute to. The hard-working Ko Hoi Min. Hui Min, sorry. <laughs> you know who this person is. She is now famous in research. And this person who is Prof Sharu. And you can see here Sister Rahiba, who uh, was the, my main uh, sidekick all these years, holding the ship steady, trying to steer everybody, stop all the nurses from resigning and crying away. She was the real rock. Thank you very much, Sister Rahiba. And, and you can see on my right side, the right-hand man, uh, Prof Chinaiwen, and my right-hand girl, Girl Friday, uh, Tan Kitman, were all here. Thank you very much for your presence here. I'd like to just point out some of our a little achievement that we have had is uh, the, with the Japan International Goodwill Foundation. And we have nurses being sponsored by the Japanese to go to Japan to study their elderly health care. Uh, and I'd like to state that Dr. Akemi Sensei and Fumikaze Onishi-san were very helpful and, and continue to be in helping sending so many nurses out there. They pay for the flight, everything, all expenses pay. It was a, it's a very special, special gift that they have given us. And we are really honored to be the one chosen by them.
And these are some of the nurses and that fellow here who has been there to see their hospital. This slide is a vignette of the things that hold, I hold dear to the Malaysian Society of Geriatric Medicine. This was the first inaugural meeting, and you can see all the young faces have grown a little bit older now. Ellen Pock, slightly older. Uh, no Diana, and elsewhere. My involvement with the Alzheimer's Disease Foundation, and I thank many of them have come today. Uh, Dato Yim, who is the, uh, our spiritual and physical leader. Uh, and you can see that it's a world organization pushing for Alzheimer's cure. And the, the Asia Pacific Geriatric Conference that I, I work with. These are the overseas links that have sowed the seeds of growth in Malaysian geriatrics. Let me just start by saying that Professor Gary Andrews, who was the, the Western Pacific Regional Office consultant, was, ten, was really one of the, my good friends and uh, a previous president of the IAAG, or IAGG. He came over and helped to set up the technical committee for AG. He helped to push a lot of people in the Ministry of Health together to move things forward. Professor Shah Ibrahim, who was a dynamo, who has helped Prof Sharo get her PhD. And the gang of seven here were the gangsters that all came around me and said, Philip, you're doing the next Asia Pacific Geriatric Conference. I said, it's only six months. How do you expect me to do that? But six months later, we did host the Geriatric Conference the Asia-Pacific Geriatric Conference, which was, uh, uh, we had about 550 uh, participants, and I'm wearing the same tie that I wore that day. Dr. Yi Jai Hua, a close friend from Singapore, who helped me, helped me with the design and uh, development of the geriatric ward. Prof. Chia Yok Chin, as you can see down here, with Duncan Forsyth, who will be our speaker at the National Geriatric Conference this year. And some people from Singapore who were actually Malaysian before, who continue to help us on a regular basis because they want to go home and taste some good food. And here we have Robert Prouse with our two specialists now, uh, Dr. Riza and Dr. Amin, who are kindly here as well. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, they worked with Robert Prouse for six months and learned a lot there. And Amin came back with a bow tie. Now, these are the escapers. Can you be an escaper to escape all illness after 80? This is my Uncle Chen who's standing here. Oh, he's sitting down here. He is working out in the gym. There you are, Jityang. Look left. There you are. And my aunt who is doing something that even UITM students said cannot laugh. Okay. It's quite difficult to do that sitting stand, so I, I like to challenge you tonight to try this. The, both of them are over 90 and still hale and healthy, thank goodness. I'd like to thank my wife, who here is shown holding her favorite item, a baby, and, uh, and my children, who are all uh, showing off their slight, uh, slightly more uh, physical bodies than the father. Uh, for being supportive and being so patient with me because I've been away for so many meetings and such like. And uh, at one stage, my wife said, I have to put a photograph next to the bed so that they know that this is not their uncle. <laughs> there are other women in my life. My wife knows this, thank goodness. <laughs> this is Dr. Soraya, who, as usual, tells me everything through the ear and has picked my belts, my lipstick for my wife, and everything else, my shirts as well. So she decides my, my garb. Um, and here we have Norma. Norma, thank you for coming as well. Norma Dali, one of my close friends from the Gerontological Association, with Tunku Aizan next to, uh, next to Molly Chia, who I think is not here. And here we have the two girls that uh, keep, uh, keep the, the engine running in the engine room. Thank you very much for your, your work, and I'm grateful for that. And I'd like to dock my mortar board for you. 
And of course, the girls that are behind the scenes that without which this Sharan Badana would not probably occur because they would have switched off all the lights. Thank you very much, Rohana and gang. And I'd like to thank you with this uh, vignette of my life. And I'll start from the top here. And uh, you can guess who that is. That's me on my first bow tie. <laughs> These are friends of mine, Tony, Professor Tony Bro from New South Wales and Edward Leong from Hong Kong, who have given me a lot of advice during the time that we were struggling, you know. It's, when you're alone, it's tough. It's very hard. You know, you say, ah, give up and go to private practice. Uh, and these people say, no, no, you just keep plugging on. You'll be all right. You know, and they, they helped a lot. Uh, and, and you can see here um, Bob Penhall, who used to work in Adelaide as well, who's retired now. Now, this, uh, for the students, is the way to talk to ministers in your, on your knees <laughs> after dinner when they are satisfied, not hungry. And between VIPs, you see, you've got to go down on your knees and explain to them why you need things to happen. Okay? At that time, uh, Dato Sri Leo was the uh, health minister, but now he's got other things to do. And uh, we have here myself when I was younger, as the best man of one of my friends in the UK, wearing a top hat. My dear Soraya Kunanagam, who was who's, uh, uh, previously a lecturer here, who has gone to private now. And Robert Yeo and uh, and Fleming, uh, yeah, and Fleming, Wendy Fleming, who are uh, both very close friends of mine from Australia and New Zealand, working in uh, Alzheimer's dementia. <sighs> That's one also with my wife and me trying to be Bollywood stars. <laughs> the rest of the photographs, most of them were taken by my wife, who obviously knew I liked old people, so kept taking photographs of old people everywhere. So i like to wish you, all of you, a long and interesting life. Because this is the normal situation that will occur. You get fed from cradle to grave. Where are you now? Are you at this point? I hope all of you are not there yet, okay? And you have to be striving as, to be successful as this blimping tree that we have at the back of our house. All, some of you have experienced the blimping for the last God knows how many years. Uh, Sister Ray knows, my wife, you know, this is the most expensive blimpings you can handpick by an obstetrician and gynecologist. Okay. <laughs> Risking life and limb on ladder to pluck for you. So it is something special to have a blimping from Philip Boy. Blimping Bulo. In case you don't know how to do anything about bilimbings, please consult the girls down here who have fantastic recipes to share with you. I think it's time for a coffee break. So I'd like to thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Prof. Um, distinguished, uh, distinguished guests, I would like to call upon Professor Dr. Adiba Kamuzaman to conclude the lecture which was being delivered. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. I think I made a mistake when uh, I introduced you as the father of geriatric medicine in Malaysia. I should have, looking back at um, the, the history of uh, development of geriatric medicine in Malaysia, I probably should pronounce you as the grandfather of geriatric <laughs> medicine in Malaysia. Um, I, I can't help myself. I think we have 40 infectious diseases uh, physicians in Malaysia <laughs> from about the same time as, as we both started. Competitive to the core. <laughs> so anyway... Um, uh, what a wonderful lecture going through the development of uh, geriatric medicine in Malaysia and also the challenges that we face as uh, we all age. Um, as they say, there's only one certainty in life, that we're all going to die, but there's a second certainty in life, which is we're all going to get old. And it's really quite sobering to know that um, 
you know, that many of us uh, reach AT um, with at least uh, two or more illnesses. And you've inspired me with your aunt. Who's your aunt? Who can do... Who can do the boat pose at the age of 90. So that's going to be my, no, no, not you. <laughs> to, to, um, to, so all of you, there's a challenge that we can all do the, the yoga boat pose. It's, it's called the yoga boat pose at the age of 90. I think that is something that we all need to, to aim for. And uh, uh, apart from being physically um, uh, healthy, of course, to be mentally alert and uh, I think, uh, Philip, you have certainly um, made your mark at, at the faculty and at, at, um, at the university in terms of um, not just setting up the uh, unit, the, the geriatric medicine unit, but really inspiring a whole new generation of, of geriatricians. The, the two girls and others that you've mentioned in, in the unit are the powerhouse, not just of Department of Medicine, but also in the faculty. Um, for those of you who are not aware, they, they are um, in the midst of doing a very, very important and large studies, not just study, um, multidisciplinary studies to help us um, really plan the way forward for geriatric care in, in the country. So not only are they superb clinicians um, together with, with Philip and the others, but they're also world-class researchers. So we're very proud to have um, the geriatric medicine unit in the faculty um, as uh, led by Philip. So 60 is just a number. <laughs> 60 is just a number. And uh, yes, we will all have to lobby for this uh, ageist um, uh, policy that we currently have um, that, that allows people to retire well before they, they're due. So thank you very much. And... Um, all the best, yeah. Thank you, Prof. Adiba, for sharing this lecture. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all for their time, Management of Faculty of Medicine, International Corporate Relationship Officers, and all. Um, With this, we have reached the end of the lecture. On behalf of University of Malaya, I would like to apologize if there is, had been any weakness from our side in organizing this lecture. Refreshment will be served next door to the Medicaid. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you.